Hello and welcome to this special edition of C++ Weekly. In this episode, I am going to review G++ 2.4.5. Now, G++ 2.4.5 was released in 1993, which makes it one year newer than the Turbo C++ 3.0 review that we did in the past couple of weeks. But it is about as contemporary of a version as I could find for GCC, and I'll show you why and how I got there. So first of all, I am running in Slackware 1.01, .01, which is the oldest version of Linux in a distribution that I could find to install. Now, previous versions of GCC to this, within uh, a couple of years, they don't even list Linux as being a target. So you can see here that I'm actually running Linux kernel 0.99, so it's pre-1.0, and we've got G++ 2.4.5. So we're going to start from here and we're going to see what we've got. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time covering what C++ features G++ 2.4.5 actually implements because it's contemporary with the Turbo C++ 3.0 review that we did. So we know that it's pre-standard C++. We know that our standard header files have .h after them, which they don't these days. Template support is very minimal, but it does exist. There are no namespaces yet. So we're just going to mostly focus on what kind of code generation this actually creates, what optimizations it can do, and general how good of a compiler it was. We're using Linux. This comes with VI, obviously, because VI is in basically every version of Unix that's ever been made. So that's very helpful. And we're not going to have a very visually exciting episode today, unfortunately, because, well, we're using the Linux console, and we don't really have even X Windows running at the moment. So the first interesting thing to note is that G++ actually does not recognize the .cpp extension. So if I want G++ to recognize this file as a C++ file, I need to use .cxx or .cc, so I'm going with .cc. So we've built our test code here that gives us a debug statement on default construction, copy construction, destruction, and copy assignment. And we're going to see how many different operations we get here. Uh, root with no password. Good old early Linux <laughs> distributions. So we're going to compile um, without any optimizations enabled at, all, at first, and we see the compiler is smart enough to actually warn us, saying that control reaches end of non-void function. So let's fix that, although it doesn't really matter for this example. So with no optimizations enabled, we get one constructor, one destructor. We're getting the return value optimization that we expect. Now let's do a named return value. And we get a copy constructor and two destructors. This isn't terribly surprising. This is what we saw with Turbo C++. Now let's see if we can amp up our optimizations. Still get the same result. So let's try the one case that definitely confused Turbo C++. And we're getting an extra copy here where we really didn't need to be getting one. And we will return like that. And we see we get one copy, or uh, one default constructor, and one destructor. And we'll try that in both cases, with no optimizations and with some optimizations. We're getting the same results. So let's take a step back now, and I kind of want to play with constant folding and some of the other things that we would see from a modern compiler. So let's look at the code gen, and if you followed any of my other videos for C++ Weekly. You know, this is the kind of thing I like to play with. So we're going to do it, uh, tell it to output the assembly and that we want to compile only. No, that's pre-process. That's 
output assembly. So that gives us test perf 1.s. So in this code, we have no optimizations enabled, and it's clearly generating a lot of code and jumping around to different labels that don't make a whole lot of sense to me. But it's doing stack management and returning the value 5 in the register EAX, and it's defaulting to the uh, AT&T assembly syntax output. I don't even know if Intel existed yet at this point. So let's turn on optimizations. And we can see a much simpler result, that it is basically just moving 5 into the AX register and returning, but it's still doing stack management, which a modern compiler wouldn't do. So if we instead did something like this, the question is, how good was our compiler in the day? And we see that the compiler is getting rid of that i variable altogether and just returning 5. And we can see if we keep pushing it. So it has completely removed all memory allocation for the variables i and j. And I do not believe that Turbo C was doing this. I believe in the videos that we did before, we actually saw that Turbo C was allocating memory for them and there were addresses for those variables. So this is pretty cool and not too far off from what we would expect a modern compiler 24 years later to do. So there's a lot of these things that we've uh, tried to protect ourselves from and optimize code for that really haven't been necessary in at least, well, let's say 23 years. Now let's play just for a moment and see if we can get any kind of loop unrolling or something and see what we got there. So this has not done any kind of constant folding or loop unrolling or anything. We can see that it is seems to actually be implementing a loop with a label L411, where it is incrementing the EDX register, adding the EDX register into EIX, and doing that until EDX is equal to 9. And then when it is done, I believe if I'm reading this correctly, EAX will have the return value for main. So it has at least done a register allocation for us automatically. We haven't had to put that any of these values need to be register. That's been done by the compiler for us automatically. So that's, again, something for at least 23 years that the quote, register keyword has been mostly meaningless. The optimizing compiler has been better at guessing that kind of thing than we were. Well, thanks for following along with this episode of C++ Weekly Special Edition as we play with more old compilers. Be sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and check out any of the links below.